Steam Deck, it's been a long time coming, but it's finally here and it's quite remarkable. I mean, look at this, a handheld games machine capable of not just running the latest games, but actually running them very well indeed. The vast majority of titles we're playing here running at console equivalent settings, sometimes even better, resolution apart. I've seen a lot of Steam Deck coverage in the run up to launch, a lot of great testing, but going hands on, actually playing some games, seeing what this thing can do, at its best, it's a fascinating piece of remarkably performant technology, if not quite the deck of dreams that many hope it will be. There's still plenty of rough edges to smooth off. But the bottom line though, Steam Deck's performance exceeds my expectations and literally everything you've seen in this gameplay montage is raw capture from the deck. I framed it within the Steam Deck render here so the footage isn't scaled. Whether the game runs at 720p or full native res 800p, it's a one-to-one -one pixel map within this 1080p video. We'll go more into performance later on, but first impressions on the machine. Well, I was sent the 512 gigabyte SSD version. Now, we know all about the form factor by now, and it's fair to say that it is larger than established handhelds like Switch, for example. You need space for a decent cooling assembly and a large bat fee to house this kind of performance. But you know what? I find the deck easier to use than the Switch. When strapped onto the console, a Switch's Joy-Cons don't really provide good support for your entire hand, leading to pins and needles and numbness in extended play sessions. Steam Deck may be larger, much larger, but its grips really make a difference in terms of comfort, also allowing you to easily handle its weight. Analog sticks, D-pad, face buttons, an interesting merging of Xbox and Switch that works rather well, with the twin pads on either side allowing the deck to access mouse-driven games. Shoulder buttons and triggers feel great, and while it's nice to see the paddles on the rear of the machine there, I often found myself activating them by accident during the run of play. I'm not going to dwell too much more on the form factor. Overall build quality is solid, plastics are reasonable. Uh, the system consumes a lot more power relative to Switch, but the cooling is fine. The system feeling warm to the touch on the rear, but never hot. This is of little consequence to the user anyway, as the grips are kept well away from the heat. Steam Deck never feels uncomfortable to hold, and that's great. I also enjoyed the speaker quality, actually a bit of bass for once. The only issue here is that often the audio quality is compromised by fan noise. Now, the fan noise isn't loud as such, but it has an intrusively high pitch. And I think it's fair to say that the screen is a bit of a disappointment. It's fine, it's adequate, but color reproduction is not outstanding. There's no variable refresh rate support that would have been really useful for this kit. And it, the screen itself, it's not particularly vivid, meaning it's best for indoor play. It's not super bright at all, even at max settings. Ports wise, nothing on the bottom except micro SD card access, while on the top we have volume controls, 3.5 millimeter stereo jack for headsets, along with a USB-C for power, video out, USB expansion and the like. Valve does have a bespoke dock on the way, but any decent USB-C hub out there should do the job. Just make sure you get one with USB-C power delivery pass through because you're gonna need it. So that's the physical form factor. And yes, I'm also only going to spend a short time talking about the UI because fundamentally it's exactly as you would imagine it. It's Steam on a handheld. Underneath the trackpad on the left is the Steam button, which gives you easy access to Steam essentials, the home screen, your library, the store, the usual Steam stuff. On the right, a mirroring menu button gives fairly quick access to notifications, your friends list, a pared down settings option screen, and most intriguingly of all, a performance menu. Here, you can specify varying levels of internal performance metrics, the ability to toggle between frame rate caps of 30 and 60 FPS, and even the ability to change the Van Gogh APU's thermal power limit, and even its GPU clock speed. The 30 FPS toggle, it's extremely useful as we shall see but I'd recommend leaving uh, the other options just as they are. Now, the scaling filter here is perhaps more useful when docked, but essentially it tells the deck what you want to happen when a game is running at resolutions 
underneath 800p or 720p. You can upscale with a standard linear technique, a nearest neighbor algorithm, which is potentially great for retro emulators, and an integer option, which basically leaves it at native res with black borders around it. FSR, Fidelity FX Super Resolution, well, essentially you can choose the display resolution in game and FSR then scales it up to the screen's native pixel count and you can adjust the edge enhancement effect. It's still FSR, but somewhat different to normal in-game FSR, which should always be chosen in preference to this one, in my opinion. In-game FSR usually works on the 3D content only, leaving HUD elements at native res. The system level FSR though upscales everything, which is not ideal. The interface is fine, uh, but certainly not paired back and simple like a console would be. In truth, it couldn't be. It's a PC. There's just far too much going on, but I think Steam users will appreciate the levels of functionality on offer here. The only real criticism of the UI beyond its density is that it can be fairly slow and it's definitely a bit cumbersome to use. But Valve does deserve some kudos here for the suspend function, essentially allowing you to pause gameplay whenever you want and put the system into a deep sleep state. Essential for bite-sized gaming on the go, but this system does need to be expanded to include the ability to download games while the system is suspended, something that was there on day one on Nintendo Switch. As it is, if you're downloading games on the deck, it has to be fully active during the entire download time. I've spoken to Valve about this and they do say that this is a feature that they are aggressively working on, so fingers crossed this will be added soon. So let's talk about performance, where I think it is reasonably safe to say that Steam Deck exceeds my expectations, especially considering the onerous limitations in effect here. Let's consider each of them in turn. First of all, this is an AMD APU. Uh, we have a four core, eight thread Zen 2 CPU cluster and the RDNA 2 GPU occupy the same die, essentially competing for resources between them. Something few, if any developers would have catered for in their game designs. Core to those limited resources is the power input capped at a relatively minuscule 15 watts. Secondly, we have the Linux-based nature of the deck itself. The vast majority of the library are titles designed for Windows, and those need to go through the Proton compatibility layer in order to work, which must surely limit performance to some extent. To what extent it does limit performance, we don't know right now, because Windows drivers for the deck are not available during this part of the review period. And that's a bit of a shame. In analyzing performance on the deck, for this segment I am benching at 720p resolution three ways. First of all, we have the unlocked performance of the deck itself running via the bespoke Steam UI. Now this is always running with vSync on, there's nothing you can do about that. Even if you specify turning off vSync within the game menus, it always stays on. Secondly, I rebench the same areas with the deck's 30fps cap active. What we're testing for here is stability, right? For a 30 FPS mode to work effectively, you need a new frame every 33.3 milliseconds, not the uneven frame delivery we've often seen elsewhere and complained about. Finally, we do manage to get VSync off measurements with fully unlocked performance via the Linux desktop. Here, thanks to an assist from Twitter user JiraD, we have a customized version of what is essentially the Linux equivalent to Revatuna statistics server, Mango HUD. <laughs> the flashing border on the left there is the FCAP border markup, allowing us to easily track frame persistence with VSync off. Now, a word of caution on the desktop benchmarks. Valve tells us that only four CPU threads are available, potentially impacting performance when the game is CPU limited. Thankfully, the vast majority of the tests here put GPU first, with CPU issues only having a very minor impact, as we shall see. Before we go on, a word on presentation. For benchmark tests, I'm demonstrating the content tested here by showing what you might call hero background video. This is running at the same settings as what I used for the deck tests, but for the purposes of making a good looking video, it's 1080p and 60fps. Now over this, I'm plotting the frame rate and frame time data from the deck as it was analyzed in those three different ways. So let's get into it, starting with control, where I benched at enhanced console settings. 
Consoles are effectively PCs low with medium reflections. I've bumped these up with high level of detail, high textures and high texture filtering. You'll note immediately that we're kicking off with unlocked performance that's actually touching 60 frames per second. Via the Linux desktop or Steam UI unlocked, we average between 48 to 49 FPS at 720p across the run, which I think is absolutely remarkable as an opener. This is in no way the most complex scene in Control, but the key is we have overhead here if we choose to run the game at PS4 level 30 FPS. Aside from dips as we transition into gameplay and some flutters during a cutscene, the 30 FPS cap is essentially perfect with absolutely fine frame pacing. Now, comparing the Linux desktop with VSync off with Steam UI, which always has VSync on, you can see that frame delivery is smoother in Linux while the DeX interface careens between 16 millisecond and 33 millisecond screen updates. Stutter versus tearing basically, but if you're sticking with Steam UI, as most people likely will be, stutter it is. Now that's why I prefer 30 FPS generally in these scenarios. You're gaining consistency and indeed battery life, thanks to the low overall frame rate. Shadow of the Tomb Raider next and a curious one because we have a rather good native Linux port here via Feral Interactive. The one caveat being that Feral tells me that running this game on Steam Deck has not been validated. Still high settings here, one notch down from the top and we're seeing rather good results. The entire benchmark sequence rolls out north of 30 FPS with the unlocked Steam UI delivering 39 FPS up against 38 from the Linux desktop. Now this is likely down to the more limited CPU resources. As we move into the third segment of the bench, you can see that the cyan line is stuttering where the unlocked deck UI doesn't seem to be losing performance. The 30 FPS mode, a few dropped frames in that final segment, but man, it's very, very consistent overall. Extremely impressive stuff, bearing in mind that we're pummeling the deck here with high settings, not the medium or low presets typically associated with mobile PC gaming on an integrated GPU. Uh, Kojima Productions Death Stranding next and we're running on default settings here which by and large are a match for the PlayStation version of the game only we're rendering at 720p versus a PS4 operating at 1080p with a cap 30 FPS. Across this short run we're looking at a 46 to 47 FPS average on the unlocked renditions uh, of the bench here while aside from tiny, mostly unnoticeable blips, 30 FPS is 30 FPS as it should be with even frame persistence. Yeah, I mean, there are interesting comparisons to have with the last gen consoles generally, which we'll talk about later, but I'd chalk this up as another win for the deck. Now, Playground Games Forza Horizon 5 next, and again, I'm not sparing the system some challenging content. I'm running at flat high settings here, but I've moved up motion blur to the long setting, uh, which greatly aids fluidity in motion, especially at 30 FPS. I've also moved MSAA anti-aliasing up from high's standard 2X to 4X, because the content of the game was designed around 4X, with vegetation in particular looking a bit rough without it. In short, I'm making demands of the deck here, and this benchmark sequence is far more challenging than most of the game content. 37 FPS unlocked with Steam UI versus a faster but more unstable 39 FPS uh, in the Linux desktop. More unstable I guess from the CPU overhead but you know still good stuff overall. Uh, minor dropped frames at 30 FPS but fine overall from the deck bearing in mind how challenging this particular test is. Now when I'm playing the game it mostly plays out flawlessly with a 30 FPS cap based on my experiences. Finally Horizon Zero Dawn, the benchmark sequence is based around Meridian, the most challenging area in the game and we're running at 720p with original settings here, a match for PlayStation 4 then, just at a lower resolution. One thing to bear in mind with this game is that it does compile its shaders in the background as you play and this can cause issues for a resources limited system like Steam Deck. My recommendation is to load up the game, start it and let it sit for a while before playing, otherwise you are prone to some bad stutter. Once shader compilation is sorted, it's a good showing here. 41 FPS average unlocked via the Steam UI versus 39 FPS with VSync off on the Steam desktop. Again, likely down uh, to reduced CPU resources. 
Keep your eyes on the yellow line though. Consistent 30 FPS, consistent frame times once again from a system level frame rate cap. And this is pretty impressive stuff. All of these games run at 30 FPS on the last gen consoles. You can run them all at 30 FPS on Steam Deck with something approaching the same 33.3 millisecond per frame consistency of a console title. And look, none of these games were tested at low settings. I've given the deck both barrels and it has delivered. Horizon Zero Dawn, Forza Horizon 5. Now these games are not super fast ultra optimal ports for the PC. They're kind of average really overall in terms of their performance levels. But the point is that the Steam Deck is running them really, really nicely. I do want to share one word of caution though, something that the benchmarks may not pick up on. I've noticed in the past with AMD APUs that the GPU tends to get priority in terms of resources, which in gaming is how it should be. However, when the CPU is really pushed hard, it competes for those limited resources with the GPU and bad things can happen. His days gone from Sony, which is a pretty great PC port actually. Using Alex's optimized settings here, we're a touch over budget on the GPU at 800p with a console level 30 FPS target. But I'm fairly confident that with some minor tweaks, locking to 30 shouldn't be too challenging. However, pop into the challenge areas and deploy the horde and wow, this is um, pretty catastrophic, right? In a desktop environment where CPU and GPU have more power and their own bespoke power budgets, and they're not competing across the same memory interface, stuff like this is really an issue. Something you need to keep in mind with the deck though. Next up, I want to emphasize the remarkable gen on gen leap that the RDNA 2 graphics architecture delivers compared to Vega predecessors. So I've got an Asus Zephyrus G14 here with a Ryzen 4900HS, twice the CPU core count of the deck, but with Vega 8 graphics rather than a new RDNA 2 GPU. However, it is fed by 35 watts of power as opposed to the MEGA 15 in the deck. So, prepare to be seriously impressed. Despite a 2.3 times multiplier in power consumption allotted to Ryzen 4000, here in Tomb Raider across the entire benchmark, the Steam Deck GPU has a 56.5% increase in performance against the Vega equivalent. As you can see, its performance profile kind of sits it in the middle between the deck operating at 720p and 1080p. This is Windows, versus native Linux, remember. You may see a bit more stutter on the deck. Remember that our VSync off measurements are taken with less CPU power available compared to the Steam UI. And yes, obviously the Ryzen on the laptop has far more CPU power. However, looking at control next, there's a very similar grouping, right? Uh, in like-for-like -like settings at 720p, the Steam Deck's delivering a 51% performance advantage over Vega across the duration of the benchmark, despite the huge power differential. And that's despite the Proton wrapper interpreting the Windows game within Linux. And finally, we're going back to Death Stranding again. We've got Proton in effect here with what you would assume has some kind of performance overhead. However, like-for-like, -like, the Van Gogh processor outperforms Ryzen 4900HS here by 61.5%. In fact, amusingly, Steam Deck at 1080p has 83% of the older Ryzen chip's performance at 720p, which is kind of nuts. Now, this Ryzen is a couple of years old now, but still, this is a huge, huge improvement. And you can only wonder what the new range of Ryzen 6000 notebook GPUs will deliver if they have the DeX graphics tech paired with much higher power budgets. Now let's get a little more ambitious with our benchmark tests. I've talked a lot about base PlayStation 4 comparisons and this got me thinking, is it possible to get some sense of proportion between the two systems, PS4 versus DEC? To do this properly, we'd need a top end PS4 game that pushed the state of the art, but one which also has an unlocked frame rate. And of course, it also needs to have a good PC port. Enter Santa Monica Studios God of War, where its Gold Master version, forever immortalized on Blu-ray disc, does have an unlocked frame rate. The developers also handed in a great PC port that runs like a champ on the Steam Deck. So let's take a look. PS4 1080p versus Deck at 720p and native 800p, unlocked with matched content 
at the same quality settings. Across this clip, it's a 32.1 FPS average on PlayStation 4, up against 34.6 FPS at 800p on the deck and 36.6 FPS at 720p. So uh, the evidence here is suggesting that despite having no low level access to the processor, despite not really having a unified memory setup, and despite having to go through the Proton compatibility layer, the deck at its native resolutions can run a top tier PS4 game with the same settings and even a small bump to performance overall, which is, you know, really interesting stuff, right? There's something else interesting about the 720p versus 800p uh, resolution differential there. Essentially, performance increases by around 6 to 7 percent by dropping from 800p to 720p. Of course, there are 40 pixel borders, top and bottom, but this is an interesting way to increase performance if you're just at the cusp of your frame rate limit. What about 1080p versus 1080p though? Kind of academic and it can only be done via the Linux desktop, but here's a PS4 versus 720p versus 1080p three-way. Yeah, the DeX APU obviously has its limits. You're getting about 63% of the PS4's performance here when resolutions are matched. So God of War was patched with a 30 FPS cap and a good one. So how does the Steam Deck compete? Well, first of all, I found that in-game frame rate caps on the deck only work if VSync is off and frame delivery is bad. However, Valve's system level implementation is generally excellent. In God of War, I don't think anybody would really be able to tell the difference. Look at those flat frame times. Slight wobbles under load, but it's crucial for the deck to get 30 FPS right. It's not quite the final finished article, but it's almost there. And that's great. This is crucial for the system. Finally, out of curiosity, I also ran one final round of benchmarks, maxing out three games and then plugging in the results from Steam Deck into our existing GPU database in order to answer one question. Is there a desktop graphics card equivalent to Steam Deck GPU performance? This is a nuts comparison fraught with bad ideas, bearing in mind the power differential, the OS difference, Proton and whatnot. But Amusing and kind of interesting nonetheless. Here in Death Stranding, the closest desktop GPU to the deck in our database was the 4GB version of the Radeon RX 460, which is also the Radeon RX 560, funnily enough. The desktop card's about 12% quicker here. You may wonder what the GTX 1050 Ti is doing here. Well, a lot of folks use the 1050 Ti with 1080p screens, and the deck is actually giving fairly similar performance at the same settings at 720p, the resolution you'd likely use on the deck. This one's quite interesting. Doom Eternal again sees the RX 460 about 12% faster than Steam Deck, but we had to bust down texture detail from Ultra Nightmare to Medium to get it running. Steam Deck's running this fully flat out with Ultra Nightmare settings across the board. Again, Steam Deck at 720p outperforms 1050Ti at 1080p, and the Nvidia card's got some weird frame time issues here. Now, you might be wondering how we managed to get Ultra Nightmare textures running on Steam Deck. The system actually allocates nine gigs of memory to GPU frame buffer memory, but that seems to be an outlier. For most games, it's actually six gigabytes, but that's more than enough for 720p or 800p gaming. So next up, let's move on. Shadow of the Tomb Raider, highest settings. On the Steam Deck side here, remember that we have access to a native Linux version. And yeah, a bit more of a gap between RX 460 and Steam Deck here. But again, the handheld at 720p up against the GTX 1050 Ti at 1080p sees slightly higher performance from the Steam machine. Interesting stuff, right? Okay, so this is all a bit of minor silliness really, but it highlights the kind of ballpark level of performance you have, and then the accelerant you get from not having to run games at the standard 1080p. Okay, so the crucial thing here is gonna be the price for this performance, right? And I'm not talking about MSRPs or whatever, because the deck is ridiculously good value for the hardware you're getting. The price here is battery life. Now I could regale you with tests on various games, but I honestly think they're a bit pointless. You're in control of the game settings, 
you're in control of the target frame rate, you're in control of the resolution, and all of these things can impact the battery life. What you're not in control of is game content, which also changes rapidly and can also impact battery life for good or bad at any given moment. All I can really say is this, the maximum I've seen the Steam Deck draw from the battery is in the region of 27 watts. Now bearing in mind that 15 watts of that budget is taken up by the processor, the rest is going to be the board, the memory, the storage, the screen, the sound, uh, the Wi-Fi. There's a ton going on here and it all demands power. And well, Steam Deck only has a 40 watt hour battery. So assuming that 27 watts is the maximum, 40 divided by 27 is 1.48, meaning that if you run games flat out, uh, you'll get about an hour and a half of battery life, which isn't great. However, lower settings, lower resolution, use the 30 FPS cap, and the load on the battery reduces and battery life increases. Valve does give you quite an impressive performance metrics overlay, which does the maths for you. So yes, you would be looking at 1.5 to 2 hours for something like God of War at PS4 equivalent settings at native resolution. And that really taxes the system. But you know, on the flip side, even with a screen at max brightness, Cuphead gives well over 6 hours of battery life. So thus far, the outlook is pretty incredible for this piece of kit. I mean, starting at $400 for a machine that monsters any other handheld, holds its own against any kind of integrated graphics, pretty amazing. But there are issues. Some games may have glitches, minor or otherwise. God of War here has minor graphical problems, but seems okay. However, Red Dead Redemption 2 randomly crashed in my testing. Next Machina and The Witcher 2, well, they froze after loading. Forza Horizon 5 started out running really badly at the beginning of the review process, but Proton improved and now it's awesome. So I've been talking a lot about the latest and greatest games here, but this is a great chance also to revisit older titles in your Steam library, which should run as smooth as butter, and you know, by and large I guess they do. Uh, that said, I did find that titles like Enslaved and Sonic Generations here could still stutter quite badly. Is it down to the games? Is it down to Proton? You can't help but wonder whether Valve couldn't have just built this thing around Windows to bypass these issues, or to improve them, or to get much better compatibility. We can't judge Windows performance right now owing to the lack of driver, but if you do go down that route, you'll be unlikely to see all of the system level loveliness, the proper 30 FPS cap, or the kind of cool hot swapping you can do with the SD cards. Yes, they are, just plug and play, and it's cool. So one final takeaway. It looks like a console, but it's not a console. Right now, at least, there's not much in the way of curation for the deck, and getting stuff to run well is often down to the user to sort out. Balancing settings, figuring out battery life on any given game, that's all on you. Coming to the deck after, say, using a Nintendo Switch, you realise how much developers and platform holders look after you in getting the most out of a resource-constrained piece of hardware. Steam Deck, on the other hand, gives you freedom, but it may take you some time to figure out, well, what you're doing, and on a game-by-game -game basis, no less. Still, it is an exciting piece of technology for sure, and it's rare that something exceeds my expectations by this wider margin and I'm sure it's going to be wildly successful. But yes, we'll have more Steam Deck content soon, but in the here and now, thanks for making it all the way to the end of this one, if indeed you did, and just generally, thanks for watching and supporting Digital Foundry. Oh, one more thing, DF Supporter Program, join us. There's going to be a bunch of bonus material for Steam Deck available to download uh, in the next day or two, and it's pretty awesome stuff, so yeah, please do check that out. But that's it, that's the end of the video. Thanks for watching.